Good morning. morning. May I make an observation? (laughs) I believe either some folks have forgotten to spring ahead or they're taking advantage of our live stream, which uh, comes to uh, uh, your homes every Sunday morning. We welcome you who are here with us as well as those who are tuning in on the second Sunday uh, in Lent. I do have a number of announcements I want to quickly run through with you. Uh, There's a thank you in there. Uh, The church collectively brought in 130 items uh, for uh, that went to the Keystone Opportunity Center. Um, A big thank you to all of you from them. Uh, Easter Fest is on this year. You can read a little bit more about that. We're mostly in need of Easter candy as well as juice packs, juice boxes, and individually wrapped snacks like popcorn, pretzels, potato chips, that kind of thing. Uh, A note about the cemetery, winter Valentine decorations, uh, we will clean them up for you, uh, but if you want them, you got to get them by the deadline, which is the 21st of March. Uh, Also, hey, we got a grave sale. Isn't that awesome? You can... uh, (laughs) There's a sale on graves. You can buy them now before the prices go up uh, January 1st of next year. Thursday work crew, short-term missionary trip. If you haven't done so already, oh, one, one last minute announcement. Outreach committee will be meeting tomorrow night at 7 p.m. to uh, discuss the Easter fest. If you haven't done so already, I think they're all gone, but I have two more up here. If uh, you would still like a Lenten uh, devotional, you can have one of these. I'll bring them down with me to the fellowship hall. I put out some uh, background history about the transition of of power in ancient Babylon as well as between uh, Babylon and Medo-Persia. It's much more than we could ever delve into in a sermon. I have copies of that on the welcome table. I have one here if you would like to uh, research or study that a little bit more on your own. I am leading a trip uh, in September to uh, basically Italy and Bavaria, and the highlight of the trip is Oberammergau, which is the passion play that happens every 10 years. Um, There's, I guess, flyers, posters uh, on the welcome table as well if you'd like to investigate that. I can tell you at this time we've had some more folks sign up um, there have already been trips. They're, they're happening even now uh, in Europe, so it, it's definitely a go. And is there anything else I need to mention? If not, let's stand for, oh, one more thing. <laughs> I'm sorry, Jerry. <laughs> this Wednesday night. Uh, this Wednesday night's uh, midweek Lenten service is uh, Even Song. It comes to us from the Anglican tradition. It is just a, a, a beautiful service of prayers and scripture readings and canticles, which are sung. Uh, Miss Sydney Wright will be my cantor uh, for that evening. I, I really encourage you to come. Uh, for those at home, this service. On this Wednesday night, we're able to bring to you because it's going to be right here in in the sanctuary uh, as opposed to uh, last Wednesday night service. Now, please stand for the call to worship. The Lord has enthroned his king, the Lord Jesus Christ, at his right hand in heaven. Now we are invited to bow before the throne of our loving Heavenly Father and His Son, Jesus Christ. Be wise, serve the Lord with fear, and rejoice with trembling. Blessed are all who take refuge in Him. Let your heart be broken. Hymn number 429.
Let us now confess our sins together. I, a poor sinner, acknowledge before you, my God and Creator, that I have terribly and in many ways sinned against you, not only outwardly, but much more with inward blindness, unbelief, doubts, despondency, impatience, pride, covetousness, envy, hatred, malice, and other sinful affections, as you, my Lord and God, know well, and I cannot deeply enough deplore. But I repent of these things, and I'm sorry for them, and hardly ask for your mercy. For the sake of your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, amen. While it is true that we are sinners who have sinned, it is a greater truth that through God's love in Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. God has shown his love for us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that, from, so that free from sins we might live for righteousness by his wounds. We have been healed. Therefore, I declare to you in the name of Jesus Christ, your sins are forgiven. Amen. People of God, what do you believe? We believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all ages, God of God, light of light, True God of true God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. And the third day he rose again, according to the scriptures, and ascended into heaven, and is seated at the right hand of the Father. And he shall come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom shall have no end. And we believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshiped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets, and we believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins. And we look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. You may be seated. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, uh, we come to you on this Lord's Day, this one day out of seven that you have set apart for your people, your particular people, your peculiar people, your called out ones, to gather together as a body, uh, to worship you in spirit and in truth, uh, to delve into your word and all its wonderful promises for us. Uh, we pray for your gathered church here at Indian Creek, but also around the globe. Uh, we pray, Lord, that this day would be a day that we would be confronted, confronted with the truth of the scriptures, that any wicked thought or way within our hearts, perhaps unseen by others, uh, might be exposed for what they are, sins against your holy majesty. Uh, we pray, Father, that people would be encouraged and comforted by your word as well, uh, especially the persecuted church, uh, especially the church that's suffering in Eastern Europe. Uh, dear Lord God, we just pray that as uh, you're called out ones here at Indian Creek, that we would take our, our commission to love you, to love others, uh, to make disciples wherever it is that we go uh, as a serious one, not, 
not, it's a great commission, it's not a great suggestion. And I just pray that we would take it that way. Uh, we all have such wonderful gifts and abilities, talents uh, that have been given by you. But they are given by you f- to us so that we can use them to glorify your name. Uh, just pray, Lord, that you would stir the hearts, the minds, the spirits of the people in our church. Stir my spirit, God. Renew in me a right spirit with you. Help me to humbly serve you. We pray, Lord, of course, for our nation as well as the nations of the world. But our attention is drawn to Eastern Europe and the Ukraine. And dear Lord, we just pray for your peace there. The peace that passes all understanding. We know that you raise up and and bring down rulers and kings and kingdoms so we can trust you even when things seem to be spiraling out of control. This did not take you by surprise. You were not called off guard. You are not sitting on the sidelines or the bench. We just pray for your sovereign hand to direct and to guide your people in those uh, war zones, not just there, but also in the Middle East. And we think of the Far East as well as a other despots and dictators and emperors in their own minds uh, continue to rattle their sabers. Uh, Lord, uh, it is a troubling time, but we know that you are sovereign. You sit on your throne. Jesus has sat down at your right hand because everything has been accomplished for the salvation of your people and for our good. So we can trust you. Dear Lord, we want to pray for the continuation of our Lenten journey uh, as we move through the weeks of Lent and and set our face with Jesus towards Jerusalem and and the cross. I pray that we pray that this would be a time of spiritual quickening. Uh, We pray that we would be convicted in our sins. We pray that we would be able to uh, stick to our Lenten fast, whatever that looks like and whatever that may be, because uh, they're excellent, tangible, t- uh, tactile, hands-on ways of, of living our faith and experiencing our faith as we just suffer a little bit in comparison to everything that Jesus did for us, and especially on the cross. We look forward to this Wednesday night and pray that that would be an opportunity Um, to glorify you. Now, as we join our hearts and minds together in prayer, let us also join our voices and pray the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples to pray. Our Father, as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever. Amen. The Savior is waiting. Hymn number 446.
The ushers would please come forward. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you in Jesus' name. We ask that you bless these tithes, these offerings, these gifts given, both sacrificially yet with great joy. Uh, use them to accomplish your will and purposes here at Indian Creek and around the globe. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs> You may be seated. Choir.
It's time for the children's sermon. How are we today? Good? Yeah? It's a little snowy outside, isn't it? Yeah. A little cold, a little chilly. Glad you guys can make it, though. And hello to everyone who's watching online. Um, we are going to get started with a picture today. And you guys might not be able to see it all the way up there. But can you guys tell me what, what's in this picture here? Chicken. There's some chickens. Okay. What's going on? That's a mother chicken, right? Called a hen. And what's underneath? Babies. They're babies, yeah. They're called chicks, right? Can you guys say chicks? chicks? Yeah, little chicks are there underneath. They're underneath the mother hen. Now, what do you think they're doing under there? Why are they under there? Oh, maybe they're scared. Yeah, they're trying to get underneath there because they're afraid. Chicken? Oh, if it's raining, yeah, they could get under there for shelter. Good, good. Yeah, so protection. They'll probably feel pretty comfortable and cozy in there, right? Yeah, so cool. Yeah, this, this is what chicks do. They'll go underneath the mother hen for protection, to be safe, to be comforted there and be sheltered. Now, believe it or not, there is a passage in the Bible that talks about, and Jesus is kind of telling us, that he wants to gather us under him. Now, does that mean that we have to go and like cuddle up underneath Jesus? Is that what he's saying? No, not totally. No, that's not really what he's saying. He's actually saying that he wants us to find shelter under him and what he's done for us, his salvation. And when he says this, though, he's talking not just about us he's talking about the people of Israel Israel he's talking about specifically the city of Jerusalem and Jerusalem was in Israel it was the capital city of Israel and there was a time where he Jesus was standing there and he was a little sad actually can you guys show me a sad face good sad faces yeah so he was a little sad about the city of Jerusalem. Let's see what, what he says here. He says, O oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who kill the prophets and stone those sent to you, how often I have longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. Now, he's saying this and he's sad because Jesus is who? Jesus is God. God, right? He's God. He's the king who came from perfect heaven to earth to save all of us. But the people of Israel there, they had said, no, we're rejecting you, Jesus, as king. They weren't willing to come and accept Jesus as the savior. And so he's sad about this. He's sad about all the ways that um, they would not Accept Jesus and even those who came before proclaiming who Jesus was, that he was coming. And so he was, he was upset. He was sad about this. But he wanted to what? He wanted to, like a, like a mother hen gathers her chicks underneath her for protection, for comfort. He wanted his children to come to him. He wanted people to trust in him, to believe in who he was, that he is God. Can you guys say it again? Jesus is God on the count of three. One, two, three. Jesus, Jesus is God. Yeah, he is. And so that same message is for us too. God is calling us. He wants us to trust in him. And even though the people of Israel had rejected Jesus as king, Jesus was still calling those and all over the world to come and put their trust in him, to find comfort and shelter under him because of what he's done for us. God calls out to us and he wants us to trust in him that he is God, that he came to save us from our sins. Maybe God's calling out to you today to trust in him, to believe in him. He's there. He wants to comfort us, to shelter us so that we can have hope, forever hope in being his child. 
I want to close with one more Bible verse that I love. It's John 1.12. It says, To all who receive him, to those who believe in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. God offers us this awesome gift that if we trust in him, we can become a part of his family, a child of his. Do you believe this? Will you believe this? Let's pray and we'll talk more about this in junior church, okay? Dear God, thank you so much for this awesome gift that you give us. Thank you that you call out to us, that you love us. God, you don't want us to turn away from you, to go our own way and, and reject you. You offer us hope that lasts forever. I pray that we would trust in your hope and find shelter in who you are. In your name I pray, amen. Amen. Good job, guys. Well done, Zach. Elder Bob Spatz will now share our scripture lesson for today. Bob? Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Scripture reading is from Daniel chapter 6, verses 1 through 6. It pleased Darius to appoint 120 satraps to rule throughout the kingdom, with three administrators over them, one of whom was Daniel. The satraps were made accountable to them so that the king might not suffer loss. Now Daniel so distinguished himself among the administrators and the satraps by his exceptional qualities that the king planned to set him over the whole kingdom. At this, the administrators and the satraps tried to find grounds for charges against Daniel in his conduct of government affairs, but they were unable to do so. They could find no corruption in him because he was trustworthy and neither corrupt nor negligent. Finally, these men said, we will never find any basis for charges against this man, Daniel, unless it has something to do with the law of his God. So these administrators and satraps went as a group to the king and said, may King Darius live forever. The royal administrators, prefects, satraps, advisors, and governors have all agreed that the king should issue an edict and enforced a decree that anyone who prays to any god or human being during the next 30 days except to you, your majesty, should be thrown into the lion's den. Now, your majesty, issue the decree and put it in writing so that it cannot be altered in accordance with the law of the Medes and Persians, which cannot be repealed. So King Darius put the decree in writing. Now when Daniel learned that the decree had been published, he went home to his upstairs room where the windows opened toward Jerusalem. Three times a day he got down on his knees and prayed, giving thanks to his God, just as he had done before. And these men went as a group and found Daniel praying and asking God for help. So they went to the king and spoke to him about his royal decree. Did you not publish the decree that during the next 30 days, Anyone who prays to any god or human being except to you, your majesty, would be thrown into the lion's den. The king answered, the decree stands in accordance with the law of the Medes and Persians, which cannot be repealed. Then they said to the king, Daniel, who is one of the exiles from Judah, pays no attention to you, your majesty, or to the decree you put in writing. He still prays three times a day. When the king heard this, he was greatly distressed. He was determined to rescue Daniel and made every effort until sundown to save him. Then the men went as a group to King Darius and said to him, remember your majesty that according to the law of the Medes and Persians, no decree or edict that the king issues can be changed. So the king gave the order and they brought Daniel and they threw him into the lion's den. The king said to Daniel, may your God whom you serve continually rescue you. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well done, Bob. <coughs> Approximately 70 years passed since Daniel and his three friends were taken into captivity by King Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. That happened in 605 BC. <coughs> Uh, Nebuchadnezzar had been dead about 20 years when Belshazzar uh, became king of Babylon, and he ruled for 
about three years when it fell to the Medo-Persians in 539 BC. Along with a, a new empire came a, a new king, Darius the Mede, and he is now ruler over Babylon. We've already discovered, you know, kings come and kings go. Empires come. Empires go. This is the way of the world. But we do know that they come at, and go at God's pleasure. He raises up nations. He brings them down according to his good will and purposes. Babylon, as you recall, was used uh, by God uh, to bring his wrath, to, to bring his judgment down uh, upon Judah uh, because they had rebelled and, and disobeyed his clear teachings, his law, uh, just as God had promised. If they did not obey him, they would be led into captivity. And that's exactly what happened. Now, 70-some uh, years uh, of captivity, uh, God disposes of Babylon and replaces her on the world stage with the Medo-Persians. God will use them as well to do what? To send his exile people, his people who have been living in captivity, back home. Uh, back to Judah, back to Jerusalem, where they will rebuild her walls as well as the temple. But despite the, uh, the, the rising and the falling of empires and their rulers, I imagine there must have been a lot of military and, and political intrigue. Despite all of that, Daniel keeps on faithfully serving his God. And as we have already seen, there are those who are not pleased with those who keep on faithfully serving their God. Daniel chapter 6, verses 1 through 5. It pleased Darius to appoint 120 satraps to rule throughout the kingdom with three administrators over them, one of whom was Daniel. The satraps were made accountable to them so that the king might not suffer loss. Now Daniel so distinguished himself among the administrators and the satraps by his exceptional qualities that the king planned to set him over the whole kingdom. At this, the administrators and the satraps tried to find grounds for charges against Daniel in his conduct of government affairs, but they were unable to do so. They could find no corruption in him because he was trustworthy and neither corrupt nor negligent. Finally, these men said, listen to this. We will never find any basis for charges against this man, Daniel, unless it has something to do with the law of his God. <laughs> Let's begin in the beginning here. Jealousy is ugly. It's not only an emotion or feeling alone. It dictates one's actions. It motivates them. It is a sin. Jealousy falls under the 10th commandment, not to covet. What does that look like? I turn to Webster's. Feeling resentment against someone because of that person's rivalry, success, or advantage, inclined to or troubled by suspicions or fears of others. Sin. Once again, some petty-minded political rivals become jealous or envious of Daniel's successes. So much so that they try to find grounds for removing him from office. But because Daniel is as honest as the day is long, like Mr. Smith who went to Washington, they cannot find any corruption or, or, or negligence on his behalf. Their only hope is to try and find something in regards to his faith to use against him. What an incredible testimony. Ah, oh, 
to have men and women like Daniel in office today, above and beyond reproach, beyond the alluring enticements of fame and fortune, wholeheartedly devoted to living and serving God as they live and serve our present day republic. But what about us? Are we above and beyond reproach? Are we as honest as the day is long with the things that we're responsible for that, that's been entrusted to, to our stewardship? We may not be in charge of 120 satraps. We may not be set over a whole kingdom. But all of us are stewards of something. Our families, our finances, our properties and possessions, our time. If some, if some jealous or paranoid or fearful person came to you to, find a, to try to find a charge to bring against you, and they scrutinized your Venmo account, or checking account for us who are older, they looked into your appointment book or your calendar. What would they find? Would they come to the same conclusion as Daniel's persecutors? We will never find any basis for charges against you unless it has something to do with the law of your God. I hope we are living our lives in such a God-honoring way that no one would find fault with us unless it does have something to do with the word or the law of God. So, what do the persecutors do when they cannot find any fault with Daniel? They change. Listen to this. This is beautiful. They change the law of the land. Verses 6 through 9. So these administrators and satraps went as a group to the king and said, May King Darius live forever. The royal administrators, prefects, satraps, advisors, and governors have all agreed that the king should issue an edict and enforce the decree that anyone who prays to any god or human being during the next 30 days, except to you, your majesty, shall be thrown in the lion's den. Now, your majesty, issue the decree and put it in writing so it cannot be altered in accordance with the law of the Medes and the Persians, which cannot be repealed. So King Darius put the decree in writing. This is a familiar story, isn't it? I mean, we all recall Nebuchadnezzar and his, uh, his golden image or idol from chapter 3 there. Daniel's three friends were conspired against by other petty-minded politi po politicians because of their jealousy and, and envy. A law was made to compel, compel everyone, especially those who feared the Lord and worshipped only him, the one true the one true God, triune God, the God of Daniel and his three friends, to bow down to that golden image and all that it represented, which included Nebuchadnezzar as well as his kingdom. Those conspirators knew that that would be an issue for the three and they would object and as a result be thrown into the fiery furnace. You, you remember that. As the great theologian, and cultural commentator, Yogi Berra, once said, it's like deja vu all over again. Sure, different persecutors or conspirators, different kings and kingdoms, but it's the same tactic. And what is that tactic? It's simply this. Outlaw true biblical faith. That's the tactic. It's like deja vu all over again, isn't it? Satan has been working 
tirelessly from the beginning. He has been trying to condemn and do away with God's people, his spokesmen, since the beginning. That was the fate of the prophets. That will be the fate of the apostles. Certainly it was the fate of his son. So, do you remember what was the charge that was brought against Jesus that got him arrested, tried, and eventually crucified? You remember what the charge was? He, he claimed to be what? Yeah, he claimed to be God, right? The Messiah, the King of the Jews. That's it. He dared to speak the truth concerning his person, uh, his work, his mission, you know, the kingdom that was coming, that he was ushering in, as well as the truth concerning sin. And so it goes to this day. The world, Satan, his minions are conspiring together against God and against his anointed, his word, his people, by legislating or proclaiming edicts against things that they know the church, the true church, will never bend their knee to or bow down to. Whether that's in areas of marriage in the family, human sexuality, or obscuring, blurring the lines between Caesar's and God's domains, what to do? What should we do? Capitulate? Acquiesce? Throw in the towel? Do we deny reality by sticking our heads in the sand? Do we deny our Lord? Absolutely not. What did Daniel do? Verse 10. Now, when Daniel learned that the decree had been published, he went and hid in the basement of his home. Oh, I'm sorry. He went home to his upstairs room where the windows opened <laughs> toward Jerusalem. Three times a day, he got down on his knees and prayed, giving thanks to his God, just as he'd done before. All right, a few reminders here. Remember... When Daniel had learned from Arioch, he was the captain of the guards, that the king had issued a decree that all the wise men of Babylon were, be put, were be to put to death. The first thing that Daniel did was he gathered the church. He gathered his three friends, they got together, and they prayed. He did not pray for deliverance then. He does not pray for deliverance now. He prayed and praised prayers of thanksgiving. We learned then, as I recall for you now, the first course of action, regardless of the circumstances, should be to seek the Lord in prayer. That's where we begin. That's where we start. We got that. We remember that. I trust we are doing that. When we find ourselves, or when we learn of others, Bearing the burdens of taking up our cross, their cross, and following Jesus and are suffering for it. But what I want to focus in on, I want to zoom in on today, is simply this. Daniel kept on keeping on. He continued, despite the change in the law... Despite the threat of death by devouring, Daniel, just as he had done before, kept on keeping on. Despite true biblical faith and the practice thereof being outlawed, Daniel continued just as he had done before. Now, I've run through the scenarios in my own mind. What will I do? What will Pastor Scott do? If the laws, like in Canada, which has already taken place, what happens if the law in this nation changed? And I'm compelled 
by the law to violate the word of God. If I'm compelled by law, as I preach through the Bible, as I typically do, entire books, chapter by chapter, if I'm compelled by the law to skip this chapter, because the empire tells me to, what will, what will Pastor Scott do? What will I do if by law I'm compelled to officiate an unbiblical marriage or face prison? What will I do if the law compels me to violate conscience, right? Science, biology, common sense, and lie to someone's face who is suffering suffering from dysphoria or confusion at best, certainly sin, and lie to their face and call them by mispronouns. One day we will get the invitation, sooner or later, to acquiesce, to consent, in a very clear way, in a violation of God's word. To call a child a boy that we've known from birth, maybe even, maybe even a relative, who will ask you to call her him or him her. Will you lie to their face? Will I lie to their face? There's only one analogy I can come up with that it's still to fall short. But I want you to think of this. If you were a nurse or a doctor, and you were on the front line, and they were bringing casualties into your MASH unit, into your operating room, and you had patients there, you know, a patient who was lying before you, Dying, obviously dying. There would be nothing you could do to save him or her. And you were holding his hand or her hand and you were comforting them, giving them morphine, doing everything you could medically. And that patient asked you, am I going to make it? Am I going to make it? What would you say to them? Would you lie to them? and tell them they're going to be just fine? Would you tell them the truth? As a chaplain in that position, I certainly would tell them the truth and ask them to accept their only means of hope for eternal life in Jesus Christ. Friends, that's what we're be that's the reality of what we're being confronted with. It is. Do you really love another person enough to tell them the truth? What what will I do when that time comes in my allegiance to Jesus Christ, the logos, which means his word, you know, incarnate in the flesh? What will I do? I pray I won't falter, even if it means imprisonment or death. You know, I wonder as I observe the rise in certain movements, the political as well as the cultural, uh, the moral winds of change that have blown over our nation as well over, as over the nations of the world. Are we the church being set up, the church of Jesus Christ, being set up by chief conspirators, okay, the devil himself, to be caught red-handed, violating the laws of postmodern man. Regardless, where the battle rages, there, is where the loyalty of the soldier is tested. So says Herr Dr. Luther. And you know what I say? 
I say, fling open your windows and let the world see who you confess and believe in. Verses 11 through 15. Then these men went as a group and found Daniel praying and asking God for help. Caught red-handed. So they went to the king and spoke to him about his royal decree. Did you not publish a decree that during the next 30 days, anyone who prays to any god or human being except to you, your majesty, would be thrown into the lion's den? The king answered, the decree stands in accordance with the law of the Medes and Persians, which cannot be repealed. Then they said to the king, Daniel, who is one of the exiles from Judah, anti-Semitism implied, pays no attention to you or to the decree you put it in writing. He still prays three times a day. When the king heard this, he was greatly distressed. He did not burn. Remember, Nebuchadnezzar burned with anger. The king was distressed. He was determined to rescue Daniel to make every effort until sundown to save him. Then the men went as a group to King Darius and said to him, Remember, your majesty, that according to the law of the Medes and Persians, no decree or edict that the king issues can be changed. Now, Darius has found himself in quite the pickle. You know, he really values, he appreciates, he may even like Daniel. Daniel's good. He's honest. He's, he's a commendable official. He's good for the king. He's good for the kingdom. But what can Darius do? The law is the law. He said the decree stands. Now, Nebuchadnezzar the Babylonian was above the law, whereas Darius the Mede was bound by the law. This perhaps um, was intimated in the contrast between the gold and the silver in the image of Nebuchadnezzar's dream. Remember? Nebuchadnezzar was the gold head and then the torso was made of silver. These were the following kingdoms. They indicate that the kingdoms that were to come would be a little more inferior to the one before. Um, Darius and the Medo-Persians were slightly inferior to the Babylonian kingdom on the world scene. That's true. Hearing the accusation against Daniel, whom they belittled as one of the exiles from Judah, uh, Darius was greatly distressed. Interestingly, three kings in the book of Daniel were distressed. It is distressing, believe you me, to put yourself in an opposition, in a position of opposition to the one true living God. Though Darius knew he was bound by the law that he had made, he sought some way to, to get around it, to get around the penalty the law incurred but finding it impossible to do so, he gave the order that Daniel be thrown into the lion's den. Verse 16. So the king gave the order. And they brought Daniel and threw him into the lion's den. The king said to Daniel, May your God, whom you serve continually, rescue you. It's not exactly true, I believe, that Darius couldn't have done something to spare Daniel from that fate. Remember in Esther, the king had ordered a, a decree concerning all the Jewish people. Esther spoke up. She spoke out against Haman and that illicit plot against uh, the Jews. Well, that king, Azuarius, uh, Xerxes I, was also Medo-Persian. I think like Xerxes, Darius could have ordered a second edict contradicting the first, but that is not what happened. Why? Because God wanted Daniel in that lion's den. God wanted his servant thrown into prison, to be incarcerated, to be thrown to the lions. Why on earth would God want to send one of his own especially one like Daniel, to the lion's den. For the same reason, 
he allows all of his servants, including you and me, to suffer and to experience trials, tribulations, and persecutions in this world. Why? Because all of these things are for our good and they are for God's glory. The truth is that we live in a hostile world and we need to be prepared, at least up here, about the reality that as Christians, we are called to suffer. That's one of our callings. As a follower of Jesus Christ, we are called to suffer. We are marked as enemies of this world. And if we are being good little citizens of the kingdom in which we live in, then we're probably not being good little citizens of the kingdom that's above. Paul warned the Thessalonians ahead of time that they would surely suffer persecution. And he told Timothy, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. We should expect persecution. Believers around the world know this firsthand. They know it from experience. Yet here in the prosperous and supposedly tolerant West, we have come to expect our lives as Christians to run smoothly, be successful, at least if we are faithfully following the Lord. We think that the slogan, God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life, means that our lives should be protected by and from every form of discomfort or unpleasantness. That's a false belief system based in lies. Persecutions come to us in a variety of forms and a variety of directions. It is something that we should expect constantly to mark out our lives. Here's what they do in part. They mark us out. They separate us. There's a border or lines of demarcation around us from the fallen world in which we are in. And when persecutions do come our way, there are excellent opportunities to glorify our true king, God who sits on his throne. Fellow exiles, pilgrims, sojourners, remember these things. We, like Daniel, understand that this world is not our home. And therefore, we shouldn't be surprised if our welcome here is less than hospitable. Amen. If you would please stand, join me in singing our closing hymn. It's a Jesus, Thy Blood and Righteousness, 481.
receive now unto you the benediction from the Lord. To the only God, our Savior, be glory, majesty, power, and authority through Jesus Christ, our Lord, before all ages, now and forevermore. Amen. Thank you.